D, Mr. Double Down on You, your favorite personal development coach with another episode of Black Fathers Now. Now dig this, man. This episode is actually an episode with a brother that we had on the show way back on episode 81. And the brother that I'm mentioning or the brother that I'm chatting with today is none other than Kevin Dedner. The brother's a father. He's an author. We're going to talk about that as well. He's also the creator of Hurdle. And when you hear his story, or if you really want to get a really deep dive into his backstory, go back to episode 81. But when you hear what he has going on, his mission, his motivation, um, it, it's really going to jolt you into moving forward and becoming the best version of who you are. So fellas, listening, ladies tuning in, because y'all like to hear what we're talking about, to learn how we think and everything. Let's welcome my man, Kevin Dedner. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm good, Mike. It's good to be with you again. And thank you for having me back. Man, dude, I, you know, when you, uh, you and I reconnected recently and you mentioned that you have a book coming out and, you know, I also want to talk about, you know, the, the transition from Henry Health into Hurdle, because when we interviewed last time, you know, your initiative was called Henry Health and now the company is called Hurdle. So being able to kind of talk about the transition, your book, how all of this is impacting you as a dad. I mean, I'm, I was excited to get you back on, brother. And I'm glad you cleared time on your schedule to do so. So thank you. Man, I, I got to tell you, it, it wasn't a matter of clearing the time. I wanted to talk to you. I think the work that that you're doing is super important. And ever since, you know, we first talked, um, I guess two years ago now, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been tracking you and the work that you're doing. And, and, and I think we are mission aligned in what we're trying to accomplish in this world. That's it. That's it. We're all about helping brothers become the best version of who they are in a holistic sense. And what you're doing, and I'll even take it back to one of the taglines that you mentioned in our first interview, which really spoke to my soul. And you said the goal was to increase the life expectancy of black men by 10 years within the next 25 years. And when you said that, I mean, that spoke to my soul in a sense that I'm just like, yo, this brother is about us not just living longer, but living longer well. You know, and it is so it's such an emphasis that we need to place because a lot of brothers can't see next week or next month, let alone thinking about extending well life or a holistically good life for another decade. And so when you said that back then, you and I connected and now <laughs> I'm excited to see what you got going forward, brother. Man, I, I just want to thank you for reminding me of that, I have not said those words in quite a while, which I think is probably a good segue to talk about the transition from Henry Health to Hurdle. Um, you know, our company, Henry Health, when we first started, we were super focused on serving Black men. And I think that that was a very important marker for us to put down because I think what it said to Black men and what it said to the world is that we as a company were recognizing that Black men live shorter and sicker lives than anyone else. And that we were making a declaration that we wanted to do something about it. And so that's very much rooted in our company's DNA. And the vision of the company was always to build communities that supported um, even other minorities in their mental health journey. But I think putting those markers down, in particular for people of color, like we have to know that a solution is for us, right? And that we're welcomed. And so that was an important marker for the company. And of course, you know, Mike, when we talked two years ago, we had no idea that we would experience a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. We certainly had no idea that um, we would experience the murder, the trauma of, of George Floyd's murder collectively. And because of those two events, I would say that the world is much different than, than what, what it was back then. And I, I'd go so far to say that the evolution of, of the company from Henry Health to Hurdle is actually a natural transition. And I think ultimately that, that transition puts us in a better shape to, to really scale our solution to mm. reach the masses. And that's what we're, we're talking about 
you know, candidly, and I'll just speak pretty honestly with you and your audience, because this is where I started. When we changed our name, there were some people who felt like the company was moving away from its mission of serving um, Black people and Black men in particular. And, you know, the irony of that is I am a Black man through and through. Like, listen, I got, I got my... Right now on my desk, I got my grandpa, uh, James Shivers, staring back at me. My mm. dad is standing at, staring at me on the corner. My, mm. my daddy's grandfather, Mac Turch Detner, is staring at me. So I got all of these ancestors staring at me over my corner, by the way, it's my great grandmothers. Mm. Um, so wow. the, the, the idea that we would run away from that is not true at all. And in fact, I think that serving Black men and serving black people is like rooted in our DNA. Yes. And, and that is so important because Mike, what we've seen this last year is the largest increase in treatment seeking behavior uh, for therapy for black people mm. and Asian Americans. And that's, that's a pretty profound um, shift because there had been this, you know, um, belief and even to some degree, some fact that Black people were less likely to access therapy because of the cultural stigma um, and, you know, other barriers, other hurdles, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will, that kept them from accessing services. But what we've seen this last year um, has been really unprecedented. And what we see happening in the market is other companies that have sort of long been established who never made it a point to try to talk to people of color. Mm. Mm. All of a sudden, they're trying to talk to people of color. And at Hurdle, what we do or say is we face this hard truth that the mental health care system, as we know it, was not designed for everyone. Ooh, like that, that's deep. Like, mm -hmm. like that's, that's the core of the thesis of our company. That was the core of the thesis at Hurdle, at, at Henry Health, rather. And, and it has not changed. And we say, well, Kevin, why would you make a statement like that? Well, the, the research and learnings that we lean on are really from middle-class white families who have experienced one trauma. Mm. So, so without the lens or the competency of cultural humility, therapy for people of color is less likely to be successful. In fact, 50% of, of African-Americans terminate therapy prematurely because of the lack of provider fit. So 50% of African-Americans terminate therapy due to lack of fit within the first, what did you say? First session, 50% 50, 50 like they never show back up because they don't feel a connection to the therapist. Oh my goodness. And it, it's interesting because you mentioned earlier, you know, a solution for us and we are welcome. So those two things kind of kind of resonate with me when you uh, when you spoke. And it makes me also think about the concept of marketing. And, you know, Joe Madison says you got to put it where the goats can get it. Right. And one <laughs> of the things I, I love when he says that, because it's like, you know, put make this thing plain. When I stop and I think about that and I think about marketing, when you see any product, regardless of market fit, put out there in the market and they say they're marketing it to the general public. Who are they selling it to? Yeah, the majority of America, right? <laughs> well, well, no. When they're selling yeah. something to the general public, they're not right. selling it to black people. They're uh, selling yeah, absolutely. It. That's exactly what I was implying. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. To middle class, you know, suburban white. That's who they're selling to. It's only when they specifically say this is for African Americans, this is for people of color, this is for black, this is for Asian or whatever that is specifically marketed for that. Otherwise, it's just assumed that general public does not mean us. And so that's yeah. why it's so important for you all to create solutions that have us in mind. Even though you can serve the general public, you're creating solutions through the lens of who we are because we matter and we want to feel welcome. That's not always been the general case. Yeah, unfortunately, Mike, you, you just hit the nail on the head which is why I felt like it was really important for us to start where we started and to make the type of statement that we made. Um, us starting where we started 
makes for a different conversation for you and I, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. Like, you know, we have a different bun. Um, and I would even say that, you know, consumers and who pay attention to our brand, that they probably feel a deeper sense of, of connection to our brand. But the other thing I just want to draw out that you said, you know, the thing that makes us different at Hurdle is we train our therapists in an evidence-based technique Mm -hmm. that helps them develop cultural humility and cultural responsiveness. And, and, you know, I I think that that is not only an invitation for Black people and, and people of color and our other marginalized populations to know that their culture is going to be honored, um, that, you know, people can show up in therapy, speak their truth, um, be heard and be believed, right? Mm. And, and I think prior to the, the death, the murder of George Floyd, you know, there are some of us, when we talked about our experiences as Black men or as Black people, and we talked about the microaggressions that we were experiencing or how we were mistreated just in daily life, those experiences were often discounted, mm-hmm. right? People didn't really believe us. And so, you know, I think it's super important, you know, that we build a, a mental health, health system that works for everyone, not just for the privileged and for the few, but, you know, life, life is hard, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> That's like, it. Well, it is. And, and it's going to get the best of all of us. And yes. at some point, we, we're all going to need some, some help to move through the dark moments of life. I, you know, I agree. And, it, and it's so interesting because, you know, I interviewed a brother about a year and a half ago, a brother named Sean Dove. And he's I love Sean and his work. He's one of the guys. That's it. That's my guy, he's a mentor of mine. He and I have collaborated on some things. And you know, he has said, and he said he states this over and over in an interview that I had with him. He said, Brother, if you don't have a therapist, a mentor, and a coach in the mix, you're gonna struggle leading at the highest level. And that inform that information, that insight, that trifecta. Is something that we all have to have in the mix because, to your point, life has a capacity to get to get the best of us. And again, we all have issues. No matter, I mean, we all have different issues, but we all have issues. There's nobody walking the face of this earth that's just completely issue free, right? And so, to that point, we need to have these support systems. We need to have these infrastructures in place to allow us to be the best versions of ourselves. And before we move forward, when I speak of support system, or as we mentioned, support system. We can't omit, and I usually do this early on, but we kind of jumped into the, the conversation, our shout outs, because those people in our personal lives that support us in being who we are, I want you to give some shout outs because, you know, we can't we can't omit that at, before we jump back into your story here. Give some shout outs from your support system who allows you to be the best version of who you are. And then let's jump back into some more info about a uh, hurdle. Well, man, you know, first of all, I that's. <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, when people get these awards and they, uh-huh. like, I don't want to name anybody because I might leave some people out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. I hear you. <laughs> but, but, but I would just say um, to you, Mike, I am, and I wake up every morning, I just thank God for how incredibly supported I am mm-hmm. um, from even like my children are laboring beside me in my work and mm-hmm you know, um, the support I get from their mother to to have some latitude to move and, you know, my brother and my sister and my mother. And, um, and I have I have a coach, as you mentioned, I have a therapist, as you mentioned, I have a mentor, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, and and then the people who I work with. Um, I'm just I feel so really fortunate that, um, you know, we can talk about, it. I've, I've had some really dark times in my life, some times where um, it felt like my life was crashing and, and burning and that, you know, life as I knew it would ever, would never be anymore. But where I am today, I feel incredibly supported, incredibly purposed. I'm surrounded by people who can help me do almost anything I can wake up and think I need to do. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's, amazing. 
Man, that's an amazing feeling. Like there, there, there doesn't feel like many limitations to to the things that that I feel like I'm being, you know, pushed and propelled to do by the universe. Mm. You, you know, it's interesting. You said I don't feel any limitation due to the support that I have. So yeah, me alone. I feel limited. <laughs> that's it. And, 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 and that's that's exactly where I was gonna go because you know now it gives I like to reframe and rethink, you know, concepts and because my whole thing is what's the point of having a concept or having wisdom or having knowledge if you can't apply it or if you can't mess around and figure out a way to chop it and screw it and put it internally so you can figure out a way to use it yourself. But when you mention the concept of I feel limitless due to the support that I have that also seems like what you all are creating with Hurdle. You're helping brothers, sisters, anybody in the world become limitless because they gain this level of support that can then free them up to, in essence, if you can imagine it or if you feel like you're led to do it, you now have the support to execute. Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I feel like back home, in church, they say sucking lungs. I can testify. That's, that's real. <laughs> and that's how I feel about that. That's real. And, and, and so I know when we spoke last time about Henry Health, you know, you all primarily serve like the DMV area, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So in regards to um, the coverage area and who you all serve with Hurdle, do you all have like geographic pinpoints or is it more wide open? Talk to us yeah, about wonderful. That. That's a great question. And thank you for teeing it up. So since we last spoke, we um, are now a venture back company, okay. which that in itself is significant because I, I want to say the stat is less than 3% of venture capital goes to, um, you know, um, startups led by African-American founders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that puts us in this, in these ranks of, you know, really having a, a really privileged opportunity to build something that's scalable that can be nationwide. And as you alluded to, the business started in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. This year, um, with the funding that we brought on board, we're now up and running in the state of Texas. We are standing up our network in California, as well as Massachusetts this year, um, 2021. And in 2022, we will enter probably right at a dozen states. And so our, our goal, Mike, we spent this last year really building the infrastructure uh, and the foundation to grow the company nationally. And mm -hmm. so our goal is to grow a national company. Um, it's quite tedious work. It's quite laborious, but that is, um, you know, the commitment of the company. And, 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 you know, let me just also say this. When we talked the first time, Mike, at that time, it wasn't sexy to talk about black men. That's right. That's it right. has become very, um, you know, sexy to talk about this work. But when you and I were talking about it three years ago, we were kind of, you know, uh, four, forerunners in this very important conversation. And at that time, we were sort of like one of the only companies that were talking about providing services to black people. Now, the, the landscape has changed completely now. It's yes. completely noisy about mental health. Several companies have emerged, but I believe our company's here to stay. And, and I think the, the, the DNA and the foundation that we have is really what's, what sets us apart. Mm. That's, that's amazing, man. And, and I think, you know, again, I have no doubt that, you know, you all are going to reach the goals. You're going to impact the nation. If you want to go international, if you feel led to do that, you're going to do that as well. Because again, it goes back to the notion of you have the vision. And I, I use this, this analogy uh, when I'm coaching brothers and it's not you, it's what's flowing through you. Because, yeah, and, yeah. and so it's this interesting scenario. Like a lot of people talk about being a vessel, right? Like a vessel gets filled up, but a vessel doesn't pour out into anybody else unless it's tipped over, unless it's kicked mm. over, unless it breaks, mm. right? On the flip side, if you become a tube, and I always encourage brothers who are high level that are moving in, in ways that are supposed to impact the masses to be tubes and not vessels. Because when you're a tube, what flows through you flows out, but you have to operate with the level of faith 
that you don't believe that faucet's ever going to get turned. Oh off. no, no, no! There's no limit. <laughs> There's no limit, and that and that goes back to the whole notion of you being supported, right? Yes, and so right. when you're effectively supported, when you have that thing inside of you that understands that I'm mission driven and I'm aligned with my bigger purpose. You now can operate as a tube and not a vessel. Therefore, you're not worried about having a bottom because mm -hmm. what's coming in is flowing out. But you know that thing's going to stay on. And so to mm -hmm. me, when I hear your story and when we talk about, you know, the book that, you know, you're now an author, the book that you've recently written and what you're doing as a dad, as a as a community leader, as a CEO, as a founder, all of that you legitimately are the epitome of being a tube and not a vessel. So I'm going to encourage you to continue going forward with that, brother. And I appreciate you saying that, you know, as you were talking, um, you know, um, my mama used to say something along the lines of be weary of folk who told you that uh, you come to you and tell you God sent them or whatnot. Mm -hmm. and, and be also weary of people who stand up and proclaim God told me to do this. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the tension I have with that is that I very much feel on purpose. Mm -hmm. I very much feel like I'm doing the work that has been assigned to me by some higher power, you know, uh, a, or God, whatever language people might want to use, but I feel very in purpose, very on purpose. So I don't sort of run around making a declaration that, you know, God called me to do this, but I feel supported, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think that, that that, to me, in essence, is what it means to be called. Like you, you have to mm -hmm. support around you to do the work. Mm. That's, man, and, and it's bigger than the moment, right? So when we think about like happiness and sadness, that's typically in the moment, right? But when we start looking at the bigger concepts and you start looking at joy, joy is more eternal. Joy is that thing that surpasses the momentary happier sadness. It's kind of like, uh, you know, like with the with the the coin, if, you know, if um, there is a stanza and if and it states if you can meet with triumph and disaster and meet those two imposters and treat those two imposters just the same. So when you stop and you think about the happiness and the sadness are kind of imposters, right? That yeah. joy is that baseline. And when we think about joy, and then I kind of transition into this book that you've recently written entitled The Joy of the Disinherited, Essays on Trauma, Oppression, and Black Mental Health. I think about that through line again, that baseline, and having that steady state going forward, but that steady state in the midst of challenges, trauma, you know, issues, yeah. and all of that. Talk to us a little bit about that and maybe even start with the title of this book that you've recently written, brother. Well, first of all, Mike, your synopsis of, of joy is indeed, you know, one of the theses of the book is that there is this joy that is, um, that is sustainable, Mm -hmm. that is um, achievable um, for those who um, are willing to, to do like the internal work mm. uh, to find it. Mm. Uh, and so you, when you talk, the way that you describe it is beautifully and um, the title of the book, The Joy of the Disinherited. Um, it, the, the first thing I should tell you about the book and its title is, the title is a nod to a theologian by the name of Howard Thurman. Yes. And, and Thurman, widely known um, to be, uh, a, you know, a, a like he, he, he was a, a dean at Howard School, widely known for his, um, his, his teachings on dealing with um, oppression and resistance, in fact, his, his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, um, is said that Dr. King traveled with this book all the time. It's one of the few books that Dr. King used as a, you know, as a resource when he traveled. And so I discovered Howard Thurman candidly a, a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, I consider myself a student of philosophy, a student of theology. 
And Thurman's work was really a capstone for me, years of um, intellectual studying, um, mental health, you know, it's from like this academic pure science place. And then also when I was depressed, um, I was trying to make sense of what was happening to me spiritually, because I do believe in, in God. And I do, do believe that there is a, a higher power. Um, and, and during my depression, it just felt like, you know, God had abandoned me. Mm. And, and, and so when I discovered Thurman's work, like all of my study sort of came together. Mm. It's like, okay, now I finally got it. Like it mm-hmm. all makes sense now. And so Thurman basically lays out, let me just try to get to the, the heart of why, why I built on this. Thurman basically lays out that there are three primary ways that we respond to oppression. He says, number one, um, we imitate the oppressor. Mm. Number two, we keep a safe distance from the oppressor. And then number three is outright resistance. So Mm. what my book is, is a collection of memoir and essays. It's the story of me, a 45-year-old Black man who grew up in the antebellum South. the grandson to um, grandparents whose grandparents were enslaved. Mm. Wow. It's the story of the things I saw in life, the things I experienced. um, Mm. The things that were passed on to me. About who I am and my existence that are not true. Mm. Thurman says that for us to reach like our true humanity, that we, the disinherited, must perform a delicate surgery Mm. of the psyche with the precision of a surgeon. Wow. And my book is the story of how I did that. Wow. <laughs> the delicate surgery of your psyche. And you, you know what's so interesting? When, you, when I think of, again, I think about the concept of surgery, there is no surgery that should not be delicate if you really stop and think about it. All surgery should be delicate. But yet, sometimes we have this concept of, man, maybe not, whatever. All surgery should be delicate because you're being invasive. And so when you start talking about your psyche, you you need to have even more in tune focus on the type of surgery that you're doing because you're already delicate because you're being invasive. But now you're tapping into something that, like you mentioned before, things get passed on to you you pass on to other generations going forward. We have to be very mindful of how we delicately do this internal surgery to get to the root of who we really are and identify where things maybe weren't true, but then also identify the truth in all of that and figure out a way to make sense of it. Like it's such a powerful, when you mentioned surgery, delicate and psyche and connecting the dots, I was just like, wow. We all need to do that. Well, Thurman says that, like, for us to really know who we are, we must do that. Mm. And, and what I try to declare in the book is that when we set out to do this work, some of what we will discover is too heavy to bear alone. Ooh. And that's when it's okay to go get professional help. Mm. So that's the that's the extended invitation to therapy, because what we have is historical trauma, mm. vicarious trauma. Like, you know, and we understand more about this today than we've ever understood before. But yet so few of us are equipped to move from the darkness to the light. You know, oh, oh, okay, can I, can I, I want to interject there because it, it's so interesting. First, you know, 
giving, you know, making an invitation to, in essence, if you can't do this yourself, it's okay to go get help. But I would even say taking it a step further, let's go ahead and get help in place because eventually you're going to encounter something that you can't handle yourself, right? So it's like inviting, it's kind of like digging your well before you're thirsty. That's one side to it. But then there's this other side to the notion of, you just mentioned how in a lot of instances, we're not equipped to handle these things alone and why professional help is so needed, why community and support is so needed. It's like, we have to understand our limits and our capabilities, right? And so it's just like, and I think to your point, you a lot of times don't get there until you have that delicate surgery because then you understand your deficits as well as your capacity. And so yeah. that's, oh man, that's deep, brother. Yeah, I, I, I think it's deep work. I, I would not be where I am today had I not experienced depression. Mm. Um, and the, it, it just really propelled me to, because I was looking for answers in so many other places. And ultimately I just had to look inward mm. and, and unravel all of these lies I've been told by my, about myself unrattle, you know, the, the trauma, the pain, you know, mm. that I experienced in life and had compartmentalized it. People who mistreated me, people who I mistreated, like none of our hands are clean here. That's it. Um, you know, and, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I, I think, you know, to your point, there is joy if you can, you know, if you can figure out that sustainable thread, that line that moves through life, that's where the joy is. Mm. Mm. That's where the joy is. It's not the hot, it's not the cold. It's that through line, yes, right? Sir. Because the hot <laughs> and the cold, you know, like, like if states, you know, those things are the imposters, right? Yeah. Obviously the book is, the title of the book is The Joy of the Disinherited, but there is an essay entitled The Joy of the disinherited. And right. there, I, you know, I sort of stretched some of my ideas around, um, you know, my beliefs. But also what I talk about is, you know, when we were kids and, you know, at, at church, they sing this song, it says something along the lines of this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Ooh. And even as a kid, I was I was intrigued by that. Like, what is mm -hmm. this joy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now as an adult, adult, I understand where that, where that, what that joy is. I, I understand, it's, you know, coming to appreciate the beauty of small things, the smell of a rose, you know, the smell of coffee in the morning. Like, just that's joy for me these days. And, and you mentioned the concept, you know, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. And then when I think about the concept of joy, joy is one of the few, if not the only thing that somebody else cannot take away from you. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why that, that's it is <laughs> the title of the book, The Joy of the Disinherited, because essentially, and, and as to Bill Thurman, Thurman declares that the disinherited are people with their back up against the wall. Mm. Wow. So, so it means, you know, people who are always like sort of trying to figure out how to get ahead in life. But even more than that, that the, that the systems continually oppress, mm. continually subject, right? So where is the joy for those folks? Mm. How do they find contentment in life? Mm. Wow. Wow. And again, no matter how good or how bad the situation or circumstance, that joy is the one thing that cannot be taken away from you. No matter how bad it appears, you always have joy. That's kind of, you know, and people always say we all have 24 hours in a day. Right. Well, we all have access to joy as well. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the concept. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Now, so I have a question. So when we stop and, you, and when you think about the book, what are your goals for the book? Like if, you know, you snap your fingers and you make this thing do what you want it to do, 
What is your ultimate goal for the book? How do you want this thing to impact the world? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to kind of understand how the book came. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I first discovered that Black men live shorter and sicker lives than everyone, I, if you will, made a deal with the universe that I wanted to write a book about Black men and their health. And honestly, I just struggled to get a good rhythm. And when I made that declaration, by the way, I had not experienced depression. Uh, and and the, so the other thing I think that needed to happen is I needed to live a few more chapters. <laughs> mm, 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 interesting, interesting, interesting. <laughs> so so um, so then um, my therapist uh, had recommended that I start journaling, and um, the first book I wanted to write, to be honest with you, was a very um, I, I, I saw it as like a very sort of academic mm. book, very scholarly. Yeah. But when I started journaling, it, it was really just more about me uh, remembering and retelling stories. Like, and, 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 and in fact, I'm so impressed with my memory, like how well I recall things even from childhood. So the first thing, Mike, I should tell you is that I first wrote the book for me. Mm -hmm. It was part of my continued healing process. Like mm -hmm. I, I had to do that for me. And then secondly, the book is an offering. And it's not an offering I'm making arrogantly or braggadociously, but it's an offering to people like, here's my vulnerable story. Mm. I believe if you sit with it, it will do you some good, mm. right? But I'm not beating you over the brow saying, take this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is an offer. And in, in those two ways, I, I don't know what will become of the book. Mm -hmm. I think if I, you know, of course, anybody who writes a book would love for it to be a bestseller. Absolutely. Right? That, that's more of like your, your, like the things that you want to come out of it based on your ego, right? Yes. But really what I want, and, and, and this has been the case, I want people to come to me. Like somebody said to me a few weeks ago, a beta reader, she said, why did you write about your daddy so much? Mm. And I said, because it hurts so bad. Wow. And, mm. she said, and she says, well, my daddy died too, but it didn't hurt me that way. And then she went on to talk about how bad of a person he was. Wow. I said, I, said, I think you ought to go back and sit a little bit longer with the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like reread that essay. And every time mm -hmm. you feel an emotion, stop and, 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 and reflect on what you just read. And she called me back a few, 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 few days later. She said, you know what? You were right. Mm. With all of those memories in the closet. And I thought that it'd be okay to just leave them there. You know, you know, so it's so powerful about what you said. You said the initial inspiration and your commitment or what you put out into the world was, I'm going to write this book about Black men, right? Like it's going to be this generic, I'm going to do something to help Black men, about Black men, about these things. And I made this declaration. And it's interesting, you didn't lie. It just wasn't men. It was about man. It was about you. And so it's kind of like how a lot of times when we when we get inspiration or when this thing gets downloaded in us or it starts flowing through us using the analogy that I, uh, you know, I had earlier, sometimes it's not clear initially. Right. It's like I know I'm supposed to write a book. I know it's supposed to be kind of something with men, whatever. Maybe it's supposed to be this. And you start to explore. But like you mentioned, you had to live a few more chapters, go through a few more things. And you came to realize that the man I was talking about was actually this man in the mirror, right? And mm -hmm. this thing that I was going to write for other people in an academic whatever setting was basically this cathartic way of me getting my thoughts out on paper. But ultimately, at the end of it all, it actually came back to me writing that book 
about <laughs> a black man <laughs> or, or black men, aka a black man myself, and it's going to impact in the way that it's supposed to. And I like what you said about I can't necessarily control, you know, metrics and how all this stuff works, but from the intention perspective, you're being obedient and you're aligned with that purpose. So what it's supposed to do is what it's gonna do. Oh, it's gonna do its work. <laughs> That's it. It's gonna do its work, right? Because you're you're because you're your own purpose yes. and you're flowing with it. And again, as you just showed, and I think I hope people follow that. Sometimes that first snippet or that first inspiration might not be the end goal. That might just be the, you know, kind of like the little thing to get the ball rolling. But this thing will evolve, grow, and materialize over time into what it's supposed to be. And that mm -hmm. to me, when I see the concept of the joy of the disinherited, that to me seems like that's what actually happened. Yeah. I I think, Mike, is the the quicker we can get to a willingness to let things unfold in life, mm. the better off we will be. Mm. And, and that's where I am now. I'm not saying that I don't have goals. Mm -hmm. And even in my company, like I have hard KPIs, OKRs yeah. that I need to reach for my investors. Absolutely. So we're not saying that we're living in this world where we, we don't have to um, abide with some of the expectations of what it means to be in business, et cetera. But I wake up every morning and, and I basically pray and I meditate. And somewhere along in there, I say, now, God, what do you want to do today? <laughs> Dig it, for real, for real. <laughs> like, what do you, like, do I need to call somebody that I had not planned to call? Like, mm -hmm. should I send an email I had not planned to send? Should I go somewhere that I had not expected to go? Like, but what do you want to do today? Mm -hmm. and, and I think just like being able to, to be open to the possibilities of uh, how things can unfold I would tell you, you know, for me, Mike, when we met mm -hmm. um, two, two and a half, three years ago, whatever it was, I had no clue how this would all work out. Mm. No clue. Mm. But I'm going to tell you, it's worked out better than I could have ever imagined. And it ain't done yet. It's not done yet either. <laughs> Come on, man. And, and, and so, so, brother, like, literally, I'm going to tell you, like, I am so I'm inspired by what you've done, what you represent and what's flowing through you, what that represents, because it shows growth. It shows development. It shows staying on mission, even if things kind of twist and turn a little bit, still staying on mission and being mission driven. Right. Like, I, I see all of that in what you're doing and everything that we spoke about is in alignment. They might be different things, but guess what? It's all in alignment towards the goal of helping people live better lives, helping people become the best version of themselves, helping folks literally step into that thing that's inside, not necessarily seeking outside, but that thing that's inside. And as we kind of wrap this up, I want to ask you, how has this journey come full circle to impact you as a father, specifically a Black father? You know, I have, I have a developmental editor of my book. And one of the things that she pushed me on um, was to make sure I went back and told more balanced stories about all of my children. So I have a son and two girls. And, you know, and, and I did that. And, and I think I, I told more stories about my son because, of, of what it just means to be a black man and watching him sort of like very closely. I've seen these spaces where he's lost his innocence as a boy, mm -hmm. forced to become and seen as a man before it's his time. Um, and, and so I think I, I, I quite naturally told those stories, but I, you know, I think how this has shaped me more, it's made me more sensitive to the legacy I leave my children. Mm. My children are well aware that I'm writing a book. They were well aware of it. 
And they were well aware that they were mentioned. And they're well aware that the book will be here forever. Mm. We won't be here forever. Nope. But according to the Library of Congress, <laughs> my book will be here forever. <laughs> man, dude. You know what I mean? That, that's it, man. Dude, when you say I'm sensitive to the legacy I'm leaving my children, like that is a mic drop because that is future, but that very much informs the present. And so, and I hope all the brothers really caught on to what you said there, being sensitive to the legacy that we're leaving our children. Because if we're sensitive to the legacy that we're leaving, that then informs every decision that we make. That Absolutely. informs every car that I step in. That informs every trip that I take, every partnership deal that I enter, every contract that I sign, you know, every drink that I take, every whatever that I, anything that I do, if I'm sensitive to the legacy that this action is leaving my children, that informs how I live my life, specifically as a Black father. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. You couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Mm, mm. So, so, brother, man, how can folks connect and learn more about Hurdle? How can they grab a copy of this dynamic book? And I'm looking forward to diving into it myself. The joy of the disinherited. Man, leave all your tags, your social media. And if there's any parting words, man, you have the floor, my brother. Yeah, well, first of all, um, people can visit kevindebner.com for more information about the book. The book is available on Amazon. You can order at Barnes and Noble. Go into your local bookstore, ask them to order it for you. Let's make uh, local bookstores thrive and stay alive. Um, and then finally, um, Michael, if someone has heard our conversation and they live in our service territory and interested in mental health services, even if you don't live in our territory, we are happy to help connect you with a therapist. You can visit hurdle.health um, for information about our services. But, you know, the thing I would just say, listen, in, in summation, the book is, number one, an invitation to do the deep internal reflection, but also acknowledgement that for many of us, we've experienced far, far too much pain, far too much trauma to process it alone. And that's the invitation for professional help. Mm. Brothers, and I know sisters, y'all tuning in too, but if y'all listen to what my man just dropped, I mean, if you don't go and do that deep dive, I would say, and I'm going to say this, it's not that important to you. Because he just laid out every reason why you need to do a deep dive. You need to look in the mirror and you need to go deep and understand what's going on inside. Because once you understand what's going on inside, you can better approach what's outside. So make sure to visit KevinDedner.com. Grab a copy of his book. Grab 10 copies of it. The Joy of the Disinherited. Grab one for yourself and for everybody that's out there. Ask your local bookstore to bring it in there, to have it on the shelves. Because we need brothers that are doing the doggone thing out there making waves because we want to make sure the right ones win because when the right ones win guess what we all win and if you live in the service area for hurdle health or if you don't just visit hurdle.health learn more about what they got going on and on social media connect with my man kevin deadner check out some interviews go back to ep uh, episode 81 of black fathers yeah. now to get the backstory of this and you know until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll let you. Peace. Thank you, Mike. No doubt.